Hello, grade 10. So this week we are starting with a new chapter called rectilinear motion. We are done with electricity and now we're going to start with mechanics with this chapter. Let's start. So these are the objectives that we are going to cover in this week's lecture. You guys will be able to choose uh, the frame of reference. You'll be able to define and indicate the shape of the trajectory of a moving object. And you'll be able to determine the characteristics of the position vector of an object relative to a reference frame. Starting with the first paragraph called rest and motion. Now let's take a look at this picture right here. You guys can see in a car, I have John in the driving seat and Rima in the back seat, while Tony is simply standing on the sidewalk. Now the big question that you guys will be answering is, is John moving or at rest? Isn't this interesting? Let's see. Well, according to Tony, it seems that John is actually in motion. John is moving. You guys can see John is changing his position at different times. But according to Rima, John is at rest. He's not moving at all. Okay, this is interesting, but who is right? Actually, both of them are right because motion is relative. According to Tony, John was moving during different times. He had different positions. While according to Rima, John was simply right there, right in front of her. He wasn't moving. So this is why a body is in motion relative to an observer O. If its position relative to O varies with time. So, if the position of John was varying with time relative to Tony, then I can say that the body is in motion. Okay, now if I took another reference, which is the observer, the second observer, which is Rima, this is another reference, according to Rima, since the position of John did not vary with time, he had the same position all the way. It means that the body is at rest. See, guys? So it all depends on the reference taken. It all depends on the observer. Okay, let's have another example. If you guys are in a school bus, according relative to your friend that is sitting right next to you, you are at rest. You are not moving. Okay, so you are at rest, but relative to a person standing outside on the sidewalk, let's say, you are in motion, you are moving relative to that person, but relative to the person sitting right next to you, you're not moving. Okay, so this is what we learn from this paragraph is that motion is relative, it depends on the reference chosen. Now moving on to the second paragraph called trajectory of a moving object. Okay, but what do we mean by trajectory of a moving object? Okay, the object has to be moving. Let's say a car, any object that is moving. But what do we mean by trajectory? Trajectory is simply the path that is followed by this object during its motion. So let's say I have a car moving. The path that is followed by this car, in this case, you can see it is the dotted line. It is a straight line. This is the path followed by this car. Okay, so this is the trajectory. Now, how about the case of an elevator? You can see that the path followed by this elevator is also a straight line. It was going straight up. Okay, how about if you let a stone simply fall down to the ground, then the path that this stone will take will also be a straight line. 
Okay, why they are all straight lines? Because guys, this is the only case that we're going to study in this chapter. When the trajectory is a straight line, then the motion is called rectilinear. Okay, so all the cases that we're gonna have in this chapter are all going to be rectilinear motion where the object that we're studying will be moving in a straight line and only a straight line. Okay, so yeah, this is the trajectory of a moving object that we're going to study. Now, paragraph three, frame of reference. Okay, so we already said that the motion is relative. It depends on the observer. In this chapter, I'm trying to study the motion of the object, but how can I study the motion if, uh, let's say, according to my position, the object might be in motion, but maybe according to someone else's position, the object might be at rest. This is why it's important to pick a frame of reference it means I need to pick a certain reference where the object is moving according to this reference, and this is how I can study its motion. Now, to locate a moving point is to know its position at every instant. It's moving, so I need to know the position, and I need to know this position at different times. So this leads us to define two reference systems. The first one is the space reference system that it has to do with the position. The second one is the time reference system that it has to do with the time. Okay, starting with the space reference system. Now guys, before, because in our case, we're only dealing with rectilinear motion. It means that the object in our chapter or the particle or the car will be moving in a straight line all the time. So the best space reference system that can be taken is the X prime O X, which is our X axis with O being the origin. And of course, I have our unit vector i, which is the unit vector for the x-axis. Uh, now this helps us. It only helps us with the direction. I will be explaining that in paragraph four more. And yeah, so I could be having the object at any point on this axis. Okay, this will help me locate this object. I will also speak of it in paragraph four more. All right, guys, so the space reference system that we will be taking all the time is the X axis with origin O and the unit vector I. When I say unit vector, it means that it's norm. OK, the magnitude of this vector is one, so it doesn't affect anything. Uh, it just helps us, you know, just with the direction. And yeah. And that's it for the space reference system. As for the time reference system, we have to take the initial time equals to zero, always, okay? And this initial time, it is the time or it is the instant at which we start timing. Okay, so when the object, the second the object starts moving, this is where we start timing, okay? And the initial time taken is zero. All right. Now, how can I tell, how can I find, this is O, how can I find the instant T at which uh, the object, let's say, reaches point M? The instant T at which an event occurs is determined relative to this initial time, which is zero. So all of this is relative to the initial time zero. Okay, so uh, yeah. Now, as as for the duration, what if I want to find the duration? You guys remember this. The duration is simply the time separating two given instants. 
So let's say I have point, I have the object reaching point M at instant T1 and then reaching point M2 at instant T2. For me to find the duration between these two instants, it is delta T, which is T2 minus T1. Okay, and you guys remember each of these instants, they are relative to the initial time taken, which is basically zero. Now the fourth paragraph and the last one for this week is the position vector. Okay, let's see what is. Okay, so position vector. From the name of it, position. So it's going to help me, uh, you know, find the position of the particle or the object or the body. And vector. So it's going to be a vector in a vector form. Okay. So if I were to define the position vector for point M, it would be simply the vector connecting the origin O that I have with this point M. Okay, let me choose another color. So it's going to be the vector connecting O with this point M. This is the position vector. And I'm going to call it O M, just like that. All right, now let's say point M that I have right here, it has an abscissa X, okay? So the abscissa for point M, M is located on the, is found on the X axis, so it has an abscissa. The abscissa could be positive, it could be negative if M was found, let's say, here, okay? So the abscissa is X, okay, the abscissa is X, then I can write this position vector O, M, as x, which is the abscissa of m, vector i. i is the unit vector of the x-axis. And you guys can see its direction. It's going to help me only with the direction. Okay, let me give another example. If I have a point right here, let's call it m1, of abscissa, let's say, r3. Uh, Okay, then the vector, position vector O M1 is going to be the abscissa, so it's going to be 3, and then the vector I. By looking at this, I'm going to see that point M1 is located on the positive side of the x-axis because I have 3I, and I is going in the direction of the positive direction of the x-axis. It's always like this. Where if I have another point, another position for the particle M right here, okay, and uh, this is of abscissa, let's see, minus 5, then OM2, okay, this was OM1, now OM2, okay, this vector right here is the position vector for M2, and it is equal to the abscissa. In this case, it is minus 5 and also i. Now, why i is so important here? Because you guys can see it is minus 5i. So it is in the opposite direction. And you guys can see it is in the opposite direction of i. Okay? Because it is negative. And yeah, so this is the position vector. It is basically tells me it is it it basically tells me the position of the point, but in vector form. Okay? So, the position vector of M is OM equals XI, where X is the abscissa of point M. Now, since it is a vector, it means it has characteristics. You guys remember the point of application, line of action, direction, and magnitude. Okay, so it's a vector. It has characteristics. Starting with the point of application, you guys can see it is simply connecting the point O with M. So the point of application is the origin O. Now, as for the line of action, it is the x-axis. Okay, in this case, it is horizontal, but it's always the x-axis. This is the line of action for this position vector. As for the direction, now, it is from point O to point M, okay? Now, in our case here, it is the direction is to the right, but if M was found here, it could be to the left, okay? So, it is always from the origin to the point. And as for 
the magnitude, if I were to find the magnitude of a vector, okay, so this vector is x, i, all right, so the magnitude x, i, okay, so the magnitude of i, we know it is a, it is a unit vector, so the norm of it, the magnitude of it is 1, so you're going to have only the magnitude of x, which is the abscissa, so I can write it as absolute value x, okay? So the absolute value of the abscissa is simply the magnitude of this position vector, okay? So you guys can add to it absolute value of x. This is the magnitude. So I'm going to explain just one more thing, which is how we are able to find the distance between two points. So you know this particle is moving, and while this particle is moving, it could be at different positions at different times. So let's say at position M1, the particle was at a certain instant, okay, of abscissa X1. Then at another instant, the particle was at position M2 with an abscissa X2. Okay, guys? For me to find the distance between these two positions, M1 and M2, Distance is equal to M1, M2, right? Distance M1, M2. It is the absolute value of X2 minus X1. Okay, and you could be writing it X1 minus X2. It doesn't matter because I have absolute value. So you're going to have the same answer anyways. So yeah, this is how I find the distance between two positions. And that is it for this week. I hope you guys find this chapter interesting. And uh, yeah, take care and I'll see you in our live session. Bye bye.